Before we start the video, I just want to say that some of the topics we cover in this episode might be a little difficult for some. We are talking about dead games, and while I think it ends on a somewhat positive note, the journey there might be painful. But it is an important topic that I feel needs to be discussed, so in order to keep you motivated, I promise you, if you make it till the end of the video, I'll tell you a joke. In fact, in order to start you off in a good mood, I'll give you a little preview of it. Where does Dracula keep all his blackmail? In his miserable little file of secrets. Oh god. Game preservation. For many, the phrase is synonymous with the right and legality of emulation. As the distance from a game's initial launch period increases, the opportunities to play it becomes less and less. As physical copies become rarer, the only way to purchase it is by scalpers, leaving it well out of the range for many. Even then, data degradation will eventually end up claiming many games, leaving disc maybe even some cartridges unplayable. It never becomes a major worry because emulation exists, and emulation will probably never go away, despite recent attempts. However, there is a bigger threat to game preservation than just Nintendo taking down ROM sites. I mean, all it really did was cause preservationists to download every game, whether they needed it or not. The biggest threat to game preservation are the games that currently don't have emulation or ROMs. You might remember a game called Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, The Game. It was a beat-em-up that was sort of a throwback to River City Ransom. It was an absolutely beautiful game, featuring great animation, some amazingly styled pixel art, and a great chiptune soundtrack. You can't play Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, The Game anymore. Well not easily anyway. The license for Scott Pilgrim ran out on December 30th, 2014, and it was taken off the Xbox Live Marketplace and the PlayStation Store. This game, one that hundreds of people spent their lives working on making it the best they could, most likely won't ever be able to be played again. Scott Pilgrim isn't the only one. PT and Alan Wake also suffered similar fates. Yet there is a threat to game preservation that no one really talks about. One that isn't the fault of a greedy or overprotective corporation or expired licenses. Destroying games well before data rot can occur. It can happen months after its release. Most might not even notice it. The game very well might be able to be bought on store shelves. Yet the players might not ever know they're playing a shell of the game whose experience it was able to give is long past. And there is very little we can actually do about it. It is the inevitable fate for many games. I'm talking about the dead game. It's a game whose design was built around player interaction and online connectivity that, for whatever reason, isn't available anymore. We see this a lot in online games that depend on servers that no longer exist. MMOs like City of Heroes, to the dozens of online games shut down by EA every year. Many of these online games aren't able to be played at all. Even if the game is still technically playable, if the servers are shut down, a large part of their design may be lost. For example, Resident Evil Outbreak. It's a game you can't play online anymore. Its servers were shut down sometime in March 2007. Meaning while you can still play the game, the solo experience isn't nearly as close to the same experience you would have playing it online. Not only do you lose out on the experience of interacting with another player, but you miss out important parts regarding the design as well. Damn, this is so cool. You're like pushing the car, I'm over here 
down in zombies so you can do it. That's so fucking sweet. Nuanced designs that you wouldn't see until you were interacting with another player. This experience is incredibly important to game preservation. I ran into this problem recently. I was fully ready to make a video about Monster Hunter World and its design differences between the original series to how it evolved into the game today. Footage was gathered, the script was written, but there was something missing and something I couldn't replicate. I never played the original Monster Hunter online. Sure, I could take a guess, but I don't really know what it was like to fight Kirin with a party of four back then to compare it to how it feels now. It's not an experience I could speak on any authority about, or that anyone can unless you were there when you still could. But what does any of this have to do with Castlevania Harmony of Despair? I mean, you can still buy the game, so that's not an issue. The servers are still around, so you can still experience it. Absolutely nothing is preventing you from playing the game online. Except one thing. Not many people are playing it anymore. Surprisingly, the threat of Castlevania HD disappearing from game preservation isn't coming from a certain company's greed or a desire to erase the past. Well, not entirely. Instead, the impetus actually lies with us, the players. It might be our fault that this game disappears. And the worst part is, there might be very little that can be done about it. This is Design Documentaries, an in-depth look at a game's history, legacy, and design. And today, we're taking a look at Castlevania Harmony of Despair. It's a digital game. I don't exactly have anything to show you here. That's kind of the problem, really. Castlevania doesn't really need an introduction. It's one of the longest running and most storied franchises in gaming, right next to Mario, Mega Man, and Final Fantasy. Talking about the series' history and legacy would require its own video, and I already got a lot to tackle with this one, so we're just going to give you a brief history lesson. Castlevania started with the original release of Akuma Joe Dracula in September 1986 for the Nintendo Famicom. It was a supremely successful series, spawning sequels on the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo. These 2D side-scrolling action platformers are now affectionately referred to as the Classicvania. It wasn't until series designer and producer Koji Igarashi joined the development team that it would become the popular Metroidvania series as we know it. This started with Symphony of the Night on the PlayStation and would continue on on the Nintendo handhelds. Meanwhile, on the console, the series had moved to 3D for a bit with Castlevania 64 to the PlayStation 2's Curse of Darkness during their Awkwardvania phase. However, the 3D games would eventually find success with the God of Vania series with the Kojima-produced Lords of Shadow. However, after the inner turmoil with the developer, the series would ultimately end with the Pachinko Screw the Fans Vania, featuring all the erotic violence you wanted in the series. And of course, Castlevania had plenty of spin-offs as well. There was the amazing Kid Dracula series, Castlevania-themed puzzle games, kart racing games, and a fairly infamous fighting game as well. However, one of the most popular spin-offs on the topic of this video was Castlevania Harmony of Despair. Not to be confused with the other Castlevania HD, Harmony of Dissonance. Originally released on the Xbox 360 during its 2010 Summer of Arcade, alongside amazing games like Limbo and Laura Croft, the Guardian of Light. It would be the last game in the series that Koji Igarashi, aka Iga, would be involved with before his departure at Ko... G... Uh, Igarashi Productions. Though Igarashi didn't create the Castlevania series, and in fact, thanks to Japanese credits using pseudonyms, we're not quite sure who did, Iga would end up being more like the adopted father of the franchise. Having taken over the reins during Symphony of the Night, Igarashi has been credited for moving the series to the 2D non-linear exploration RPG genre known as the Metroidvania. It is worth noting though that Symphony of the Night would be the only Metroidvania-style Castlevania that would appear on consoles. 
Sequels like Aria of Sorrow or Portrait of Ruin would only appear on handhelds. Consoles would get games like Lament of Innocence, which never played, reviewed, or sold particularly well. Even though I kind of unironically like Castlevania Legacy of Darkness, but don't tell anyone that. This would make Castlevania HD particularly interesting, because while there have been a few remakes and ports, this was the first original Castlevania game that had seen a launch in five years, predating the launch of Lords of Shadow by a few months. The game was announced at E3 2010 at what was probably one of the most awkward press conferences in history. Hi. Yeah. Anyway, it was announced by Igarashi himself near the end of the conference. Iga had the idea for a Castlevania game in which the map would take the entirety of a high-definition television. If that seems a little weird, remember, this was back in 2010 when HD TVs were just starting to become mainstream. I mean, HDMI output wasn't even the standard for the consoles at the time. That in itself couldn't make a game though. So Iga decided to take advantage of the 360's online capabilities and create the first ever multiplayer Castlevania game. It had taken the elements of a Metroidvania style that Iga was known for, and I mean that literally. A good portion of the pixel art was used in the DS games. But it wasn't exactly your standard Metroidvania. The idea was that players would go through levels and fight monsters similar to how you would in your typical Castlevania. But instead of exploring huge maps and fighting bosses until you got to Dracula, you would explore huge maps and fight bosses until you got to Drac- Wait a minute. The difference is, instead of a giant map filled with different sections like it would be in Symphony of the Night, each section was effectively its own level. You would fight your way through various monsters, collecting items and equipment on your way until you got to the level's boss. You'd fight it and hoped it dropped one of the several rare items it had so that you could use it to fight other bosses to get their rare items. And it usually didn't, so you would have to fight the boss again, and again, and again, and again. Also, you could do it with other players. In a way, it's sort of a 2D platforming Diablovania. Admittedly, it's a tough concept to explain and it was an even harder one to sell. Initial reviews were mixed, and some of which were absolutely scathing. Heavily criticized was the constant grinding, the reused assets, and the extremely difficult and unforgiving single-player campaign. Meanwhile, others were upset that we got this instead of a full-fledged Metroidvania on the console, complaining the fact that it was a co-op game and not a real Castlevania game. The reused pixel art and a non-standard gameplay gave the impression that it was just a cheap cash grab. The fact that it was a console exclusive for the 360 for an entire year and sold at a premium price of $15 plus another $25 if you include all the DLC, that didn't really help matters. Yet even among the harshest critics, the game still had its fans. As time went on, Harmony of Despair went from a betrayal to everything that was holy in the series, to that weird yet strangely addicting Castlevania to eventually one that dedicated communities had sprung up around even years later after its release. And it was fairly successful as well. Though it's hard to find exact sales numbers, Sony had mentioned it in one of their PlayStation blogs that it was the second most purchased digital game of the year, following right behind Journey. And it also must have sold well on the 360, considering Iga himself had stated that the game wouldn't get DLC or a PlayStation release unless it sold well. Uh, currently there will be five playable characters, um, you've seen you've seen the trailer. Uh, we might add more if the game sells well. We might add more stages, but again, that all depends on you guys. Please help promote this game. <laughs> Jeez, you look at that clip now, and you can sort of hear a desperate man wanting to escape. If only I had known, those were the dance moves of men who had nothing to lose. Even to this very day, Harmony of Despair still has its diehard fans. When Igarashi was doing the Kickstarter for Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, his spiritual successor to Castlevania after he left the company that thought this was a good idea, 
Save the universe with nine lovely characters in Otomedius Excellent. You are guaranteed to have fun as you shoot the core. And now, a sneak peek at the girls of Otomedius Excellent. I'm sorry that I just really enjoy that presentation. It's just so cringy. It doesn't matter if you like Anoa and the Vic Viper. No Gradius fans? Vic Viper? Anyway, Iga didn't ask me anything on Reddit, and fans were calling out for support for a multiplayer mode that was similar to the one in Castlevania HD. There's even an active Discord community where you can still find people to play with. And if you're lucky, you don't even need that, you might just stumble upon a random game. For an 8 year old game, Harmony of Despair has a lot of staying power. Well, comparatively anyway. Well, yes, you could buy the game right now and possibly enjoy it like you would have been able to eight years ago. Chances are the experience you're going to find is much different than the one you would have had back then. Finding a group randomly is the same odds you would get for a misering drop. And getting a group together at the same time can also provide a challenge. And in both cases, you might be playing with one or two people at the most. And that's if it even works at all. Though the servers are supposedly still active, the game is filled with disconnects and crashes from what is most likely a server that hasn't seen active maintenance in years. While Harmony of Despair might not be a literal dead game, it is definitely in the twilight years of its life. You might be asking, why is any of this important? I mean, it's unreasonable to expect everyone to play the same game forever. Games die all the time, everything from MMOs to mobile games are shut down every month, not because some greedy company, just because people aren't playing it and it doesn't make sense to keep the server up. And that's true, there is, quite sadly, a lot of games that I could have talked about instead. So what makes Harmony of Despair so special? Well, in order to answer that, we have to take a deep look at Castlevania HD's design. As mentioned before, Castlevania HD is this weird mix of Metroidvania meets Diablo. For the most part, it plays almost exactly like your typical Castlevania. Various horror-inspired monsters guard platforming sections, with you having to navigate a maze-like area to get to the game's boss. Even the bosses themselves are filled with that same classic need for pattern recognition, knowing where and how to dodge and attack. The only major difference is the inclusion of multiplayer. Simply put, if you enjoyed the gameplay of any of the Metroidvanias, you would most likely enjoy this game. And I mean that almost literally. Castlevania HD acts like a sort of celebration of Igarashi's contribution to the series, starting from Symphony of the Night all the way to the Order of Ecclesia, and everything in between, and then some. Each character plays similar to how they did in their respective games. Alucard focuses on weapons he found, using his mist and wolf form to dodge attacks, and is able to use spells like Soul Steel and Dark Metamorphosis. Soma plays similar to how he does in his series, using weapons while collecting souls from enemies to get different attacks. Meanwhile, Charlotte collects an entirely different set of magic attacks from enemies, all the while blocking spells with her magic shield. And Shinoa can use the power of various glyphs that she absorbs off enemies. And she can access areas that others can't using the power of Magnus. Oh, well, how does that work? But let's just say you're a fan of the more classic Vania style of games. You aren't left alone there either. Julius plays like Simon from Super Castlevania 4, complete with 8-way whipping and the ability to swing off the same points that Shinoa uses. He can also use his Omnia Veritas to dodge attacks like he could in Aria of Sorrow. Happen to be more in Narando? You can play as Richter, using his highly mobile martial arts to deal a lot of damage in a short time. Jonathan Morris from Portrait of Ruin uses the Vampire Killer as well, but focuses more on his variety of sub-weapons. And if that still seems like it's too much for you, you can go with Simon Belmont and all his 8-bit glory, who ends up being the most simple yet the most powerful whippersnapper in the game. Not every game has representation. There's a distinct lack of harmony dissonance Juiced Belmont, no Eric Lacard or Simon Baramont from Bloodlines, and no nods to the non-canonical games like Circle of the Moon or even the Iga developed 3D games. But we do get Getsu Fuma, the first time the character has ever been outside of Japan. 
It isn't just the characters either. The levels are also callbacks to the series. The chapter, Lord of Unseen Strings, being an amalgamation of different areas from Dawn of Sorrow, and Chapter 4's Esquisse of Violence from Portrait of Ruin. The DLC Chapters 8 and 9 are both similar to entire sections of Symphony of the Night, and Chapter 10's Origins is the entirety of the original Castlevania made into a level. Each chapter features a completely remixed song from their respective games that, as far as I can tell, was composed just for this game. And I have to admit, Harmony of Despair's soundtrack is absolutely amazing. The end result is a game that plays more like a love letter to the series. Castlevania Harmony of Despair is the Igarashi equivalent to games like Super Smash Bros. or Heroes of the Storm. And in some strange sense of hindsight, it almost stands a bit defined of the direction that the non-Iga produced Lords of Shadow games had taken. It's not all that surprising considering that, as mentioned before, this was Koji Igarashi's last Castlevania game, a series that he had been part of up to this point for 15 years. That's only one aspect of Harmony of Despair, but the key focus of the game is on the multiplayer. While you can play the game solo, the majority of the game's design is built around the fact that you're going to be playing it with up to five other players. Mechanically, not much changes. Enemies might have more health, but they don't really get any harder to fight. There's no friendly fire, so you rarely get in the way of each other's abilities, and it's not a game that requires a ton of communication or teamwork. With another player, you do gain access to the dual crushes, similar to those found in Portrait of Ruin, with each character having its own special dual crush. You also get access to the Water of Life, which allows players to revive others, meaning the game is no longer a one death fail affair. The biggest difference between playing solo and multiplayer isn't combat, but rather level navigation. Simply put, having other players makes your fight heading up to the boss far more interesting. Each level was designed with this expectation that you'd be playing with multiple people, and it changes the game in a way that you never really experienced a Castlevania before. Just having one other player opens up a variety of options available on a single map. For example, when you're playing solo, it's almost impossible to get this treasure chest. But if you continue on, you'll notice that the switch will stop the flames. So by having one player hold it while another player opens the chest, nets everyone playing with a potentially useful item. Another on the same level is this platform which is normally impossible to reach, but it's not so difficult when you have another player available to jump off of. Most levels also allowed you to go through them in different ways. Chapter 9 is an excellent example of this. Based off a of Symphony of the Night, you could go through the main hallway of Dracula's castle, fighting wargs and zombies, and slowly making your way to the big room. However, if you're good at platforming, you can navigate yourself above the castle and get to the boss much faster. But if you took the hallway and happened to be playing as a Shinoa or an exceptionally skilled Julius, you could take this path to get to the boss as well. Most times, these levels were designed in such a way that players would split up and ultimately converge on the boss. Ideally, you would have players take all the routes and grab as many chests as you could. Some levels even have players start off with different locations, but even then they were able to help each other. A player on one side of the level could activate a switch that would grant a shortcut to the other player, and in turn that player could open up a gate that allowed the second player to meet up. This amount of teamwork could effectively turn the game into a speedrun. Some levels that would take upwards of 15 minutes to go through alone could be done in 8 minutes, and a good team could do it as little as 3 if they just wanted to rush the boss. So yes, while you can play the game solo, you're really only getting part of the experience by playing it offline. Not in content, but in experience. And as the player base continues to get smaller and smaller, there is less of a chance that you'll be able to get that experience. And you can probably guess how I feel about not being able to gain experience. So the question is, what can we do? How do we preserve this experience not only for ourselves, but the future? And the answer to that is, unfortunately, not a whole lot, really. Games created with an online component ultimately have a limited lifespan. 
That may range from only a few short years to potentially decades, but eventually something will claim it. It might be cheaters that makes the game unplayable for others. It might be that the servers are shut down. Or, in many cases, as many new games come out and interest in old ones wane, people will just stop playing it. It isn't just with Harmony of Despair either. It happened with Metal Gear Online. No, I mean the good one. I love that game and I can no longer play it. I can't even accurately make a video about its design because there's no way to effectively show it to you. I was a guest on Avalanche Reviews because I was one of the people that played Resident Evil Outbreak while it was still online, and I could speak on a position of authority with it. Which you should totally watch by the way because it's awesome, there's a link in the description below. Tell them Sober sent ya. And eventually other games I love and play now will fall into the same fate. I have to spend every day knowing that someday, all that might be left of Final Fantasy XI are my memories and a potentially crappy mobile port. It's unreasonable to expect everyone to play the same game forever. If people watch this video, go play it and have the experience for themselves, that's great and if you have that opportunity now, you should totally do that. But that still has the same issue. Even if Castlevania HD was ported over to the Switch or Steam, it would be amazing to see the game get new life again and give more people the chance to play it. But even then, that would only delay the inevitable. And you really can't make the game independent of it either. A big part of the game's design is the sections where it facilitates teamwork. Certainly, Harmony of Despair could have been designed not to focus on the online component, but instead designed the game around the single player with the multiplayer functionality. But at that point, it would have been an entirely different experience. It might not have been a bad experience, but what makes Castlevania HD so interesting is the fact that it is different. And as far as I can tell, in the past eight years, there hasn't been a game like it. Castlevania Harmony of Despair might be the first and only game of its kind. That's not just important for the game itself, but also for the entire legacy of Castlevania. Remember, this game is effectively the final game in a long legacy dating back over 30 years ago. It was a celebration and a love letter to the series, Iga's final goodbye, and a testament to his contribution but also the one that's most likely going to be forgotten. At some point, the servers may shut down. It might be removed from the PlayStation Store, and you might not even be able to play it. While you could still play copies of Symphony of the Night via emulation, unless something happens with digital downloads in the future, a generation from now, people might not be able to experience Harmony of Despair. Most game companies certainly don't care about game preservation, and a particular one is more than happy to burn a legacy motivated purely out of spite. There is a very real possibility that Castlevania Harmony of Despair might be lost forever, much like the earliest silent films. Its legacy of only being known as that weird multiplayer Castlevania, when in fact it meant so much more. And again, this doesn't just apply to Castlevania. Nearly every online game runs the risk of this. And it hurts me to know that there are games out there that I might have loved. Games that I could have talked about, and they're... gone. And it scares me to know that there are experiences I've missed for one reason or another. And that there's nothing I can do about it. Or is there? While it's true that there isn't a whole lot we can do to stop it, that doesn't mean there isn't anything we can do. Obviously, seeing that a great part of their legacy is at risk of disappearing, the company that owns the rights to Castlevania would obviously create a successor that everyone can enjoy, right? And believe it or not, that's exactly what they did, introducing Castlevania Grimoire of Souls, the first original Castlevania game released in over four years. It's an online game similar to Harmony of Despair. It would seem like finally, after all this time, co- no, wait, it's a mobile game, and it has microtransactions and two different kinds of currency. <sighs> Never mind then. However, that's not the only option. 
Castlevania HD had its fair share of fans, those who were worried about the game's legacy and are going to great lengths to preserve it. Now, I'm going to show you something, but you gotta promise to keep it a secret, okay? You can tell your friends, but avoid talking about it too much. I don't want a certain company throwing a cease and desist around. Alright, I'm trusting you. Back in August of 2016, a YouTuber by the name of UniHD put out a video titled Castlevania HOD Unity Ver. It was a recreation of Harmony of Despair done completely in the Unity engine, and ever since then this anonymous Japanese developer has been working diligently to not only recreate the game completely, but also expand on it. There's already new levels, new items and characters, and also an expert mode which increases the difficulty even more. But the best part about it is, this game is completely playable, even online, and it's still in semi-active development with a fairly active Discord behind it. As you can expect from a fan project made in Unity, the game is… a little rough around the edges. It's by no means a one-to-one -one port with the original, and even after two years in development, it still has quite a ways to go. Currently, as of this video, they are looking for programmers to help rebuild the engine, as well as sprite and sound rippers. Also, as with any kind of fan project like this, there is a chance that it'll never reach a final release either due to developer burnout or a certain company throwing a C&D on this port of HOD. It wouldn't be the first time. And in fact, this is Future Supper by the way. I'm adding this after I produced the video but before I posted it to YouTube. The servers for the Castlevania HD Unity port are inexplicably down. No one quite knows why and the developer is incredibly hard to get a hold of. It's a shame because I built this entire video hoping I would have a great hope for those that wanted to enjoy it, but this just shows how incredibly fragile game preservation is. Here's to hoping it's just a setback, or in case it isn't, that someone else will be able to carry the torch, but even if not, I want this video to exist as a testament to Harmony of Despair, and to showcase the community that stands behind it. However, there is a chance it might stealthily make it to completion, fingers crossed. This mirrors a lot of the independent game preservation efforts on titles that might not have existed in the future. Resident Evil Outbreak was saved due to some amazing fans at Observe.org, allowing you to play the game again with friends, randos, and even some YouTube personalities. Likewise, Save MGO revived Metal Gear Online, and though the community is small, the fact that you can still play it online is crazy. And if I can round up 11 other people, then you know what I'm going to be working on. And yes, even Final Fantasy XI might be saved from obscurity with private servers. Thanks everyone, I know about Nosomi, so you can, you can kind of calm down on that. Even better is that recently, the Library of Congress had taken the first steps towards game preservations regarding online servers, protecting museums from DMCA claims. While we're still a long ways off from just being able to turn on our PS2 and play in Monster Hunter like we could 10 years ago, it is a great first step in saving a game's history. Even if you aren't technically inclined, there is always something you can do. If there is anything out there that you feel is in danger of being forgotten or dying, don't let them go silently into the night. If you're passionate about it, spread the word, share its music, make fan art, talk about how much you love it. Start a YouTube channel and make a video and talk about it under the guise of a documentary. Maybe share that video. It's important because the impetus is mostly on us. There are a lot of games that will eventually be lost to time, and we can't count on anyone else to preserve their legacy or their history. Because even though these games might eventually disappear no matter what we do, as long as we keep talking about it, they will never truly die. Perhaps they might even see a rebirth in ways we never expected. And that's why it's important to share your experiences. And as always, gaining experience builds character. Now I know I said this video would end on a positive note, and unfortunately it didn't quite have the impact I wanted, but you more than deserve your joke, so 
Without any more delay, here we go. So Simon Belmont walks into a bar looking exhausted. The bartender, with kind of red puffy eyes, asks him, What's wrong? And the Belmont responds, Dracula put a curse on me, and now everywhere I go I'm followed by this axe armor, and he won't leave me alone. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I'm starting to feel depressed. The bartender solemnly nods, sympathizing. Ay, what a terrible night to have a curse. I feel ya. We just buried me mom out back last yesterday. And I miss her so much. She was a good person, always helping people out with her jokes. He says as he pours the Belmont a drink. They talk a little while, but he notices the vampire seems distraught and on edge, constantly looking at the door and grabbing his whip whenever someone walks in. Feeling sorry for the vampire hunter, the bartender thinks for a moment and says to him, Belmont, you need some rest. Stay here for the night, and if the axe armor comes again, I'll handle it. Just stay in your room when he arrives. The Belmont looks worried and concerned, but he's just too exhausted to argue, so he agrees. The next morning, the axe armor finds the bar and walks in, demanding to know where the vampire hunter is. The bartender slowly approaches with a saddened look on his face and says, we found the Belmont hanging in his room this morning. He was driven mad and then killed himself with his own whip. It was quite an undertaking, but we buried him in back. You can still see the fresh grave dart from the back window. Axe Armor looks and indeed sees a fresh grave, and sensing his duty was complete, he crumples into dust. The Belmont walks out of the room, overhearing the exchange, and looks at the bartender and asks, How did you do that? The bartender just smiles and nods and says, Aye, the morning sun vanquishes the horrible night. Hi. Thanks for watching. You know what to do, like, comment, but more importantly, if you care about video game preservation or Castlevania, please consider sharing this video wherever you think is necessary. Reddit, Twitter, NeoGAF, GameFAQs, Facebook, MySpace, wherever you think people will enjoy the video. And if you really want to help the channel, please consider looking at my Patreon. This channel is entirely supported by the generosity of viewers. I literally could not do this without you. A contribution as small as a dollar a month will get you access to videos early, let you know what's going on behind the scenes, and maybe even your name in the credits here. And if you're interested, please check out this collaboration I did with Avalanche Reviews. 